Guidance is internal. Ignition sequence starts. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Permission to board. Permission to come aboard. Permission to board. Permission to bring me aboard. Permission to come aboard. Welcome to the Permission Granted Podcast. Here's D.A. Welcome inside the Permission Granted Podcast, everybody. Thanks for listening to us or uploading us, however you listen to us. We remind you, we are on iTunes if you listen that way, or we're on YouTube every single week. So you can check out youtube.com slash the DA show, and we're on SoundCloud as well. So plenty of ways to get your fix of the DA show, and we always post these to our Twitter page, DA on CBS, as well as... Uh, our Facebook page, facebook.com slash the DA show. Coming up in uh, in a little bit, we will hear from Brock and Mraz on the producer's side B portion of the Permission Granted podcast. By the way, Mraz will also join me coming up here in just a little bit to uh, to discuss just how remarkable and gluttonous his Monday night was in front of the big screen with the Giants. It was not a, uh, a good scene to the Mraz household. But joining us here on the show right now, somebody that can lend us some really interesting insight with what is going on, the mess in Washington when it comes to the quarterback situation, the head coach, the owner, and RG3. Joining us from NBC4, host of Redskins Showtime, also contributor to the Redskins postgame show there, sports anchor for NBC4, Diana Rossini, dropping on by the show. Diana, how are you? I am great. It is a bye week here in Washington, so uh, it is it is quieted down after a pretty tumultuous Sunday we had. I was going to say, I mean, I would hope it would quiet down because that had to be the craziest Sunday that maybe any team has dealt with This season, you had the bus crash, you had the reports of RG3 being forced in there by ownership, Uh, you had the protests of the team nickname outside of the stadium, then you had the dramatic loss. I mean, that was like a five or six hour window where anything that could go wrong went wrong, right? Just pretty much what happened, and and this was all before kickoff. That's what made that so sort of uh, abnormal, so to speak, because the morning started actually... Uh, with, with a national report claiming that the uh, starting quarterback w- w- was being pushed into that role by uh, by Dan Snyder and, and Bruce Allen, and that that was not Jay Gruden's decision, uh, which was then followed up by another report, uh, another national report claiming that uh, the Redskins players were revolting on Friday in the locker room uh, against RG3 starting, and they also claimed that the team wasn't told until late in the week um, that he was going to be the starter. So before I even had a cup of coffee and I'm watching this, I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, today is going to be one of those days. And, and any Redskins fans out there know we dealt with this last year, uh, the media corps did, uh, with Mike Shanahan. There would be these little golden nuggets, so to speak, these drops on game days uh, before kickoff. Where, and, and they weren't just little little nuggets. They were gigantic gigantic stories that affected the team. And normally they were off the field type of issues. Um, but you have to address it, especially if you're a beat reporter covering this team every day. Um, so f- f- right away I had to get to work. And, and while I'm trying to get uh, players and coaches on the record, um, I was actually talking to them while the bus accident happened. So now you have a bus accident. Wow. And it's what. Yeah, I have to tell you, this wasn't a, a fender bender either. Um, I think a lot of people uh, assumed this was just sort of, hey, you know, buses just collided and, and uh, it was a little jolt. But the the quotes that the players and coaches were giving to us about how scared they were, um, almost every single uh, person said they thought they were going to die. Not even, I thought we were going to get injured. I was, you know, I've never, it was like, I thought we were going to die. I can't tell you how many times I heard that. Um, apparently there was this cliff right near the bus, and that's where they thought they were going to tumble down. So then they show up at the stadium, and then there's 5,000 people protesting the name. And again, this is all before kickoff. Yeah, I was going to say, your report on the bus crash would have been a huge national overwhelming news. Because as you said, 
pretty serious. I guess the bus was trying to pull off at an exit ramp, missed it, then tried to swerve back. There was a cliff. It hit a guardrail, something like that. It shattered the window. All these guys were totally freaked out. And yet you had about three other stories that were so overwhelming that it just kind of became part of the fray. But as you said, how freaked out was the team after the crash? Because normally... It's pretty buttoned down on, no big deal, nothing happened. But when Jay Gruden's admitting, I thought I was going to die, those guys were really, really freaked out, right? Well, as I, I, soon as I arrived, um, the team was starting to warm up, and I saw a coach on the sideline, so I just ran over to him to start getting some reaction to the ESPN report. Um, and he wanted really nothing to do with it yet because he just felt the need uh, to just talk about this car accident, and it was almost in a way when you when you would talk to like a family member or, or a friend, almost when you could tell they're 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 shaken up by something and they can't help but just vent about it. And so he just kept going on and on about how scared he was, and you know, he's got a really funny personality. He's like, I felt like Keanu Reeves, like I thought I was going <laughs> to in front and, and, and drive this bus because I guess from his perspective, he was sitting in the front seat. And he said he looked over, and the, the bus driver went to grab the emergency brake underneath uh, the steering wheel. But it looked, from, from, from Gruden's perspective, that the bus driver passed out. Oh, my god! So Jay said that he jumped up, ran over, you know, shook the bus driver, and he's like, man, man I'm just pulling the brake. I'm pulling the brake. And, and, you know, everything was okay at that point. I mean, they still swam and hit the brakes, but that's what sent Jay flying uh, forward as well. So it sounded like there just was a lot going on. You know, a lot of players say that they were sitting in the back. They, everyone was flung from their seat. And, you know, you forget on these buses, no one's in a seatbelt. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, can, I can imagine it was early in the morning. Uh, you know, the time difference there, kickoff was early. Um, so this was only, this must have been 8.15 in the morning when it happened. So the guys are, you know, half asleep. They can't ready to go to the game and, and and this happens. And, and so to really answer your question, there's no doubt in my mind that this was something that affected them during that pregame. They definitely needed to, to refocus and come together. And a few of the players said that a couple of the older guys in the locker room said it. Like, we, we, we got to get over it. We got to come together and use this as something to, that's bonding us, not, not uh, losing our focus on, on what we need to do today. Well, I mean, I hate to go kind of macro here, a little esoteric, but it must feel to Redskins players like it's a little bit doomed, like there's a dark cloud, like like forces are conspiring against them because you have the protest outside of the stadium following a bus nearly crashing, following the reports that are coming out nationally about the quarterback, following a day where, again, there was the national reports and the local reports that that the quarterback had alienated himself from the locker room. I mean, these guys must be walking through the season going, nothing is ever going to go right for us. And to go back to the RG3, he's been alienated or he's alienated himself. You're in that locker room. You've seen him. You see these guys. Is there an element of truth to that, that he does not connect with the rest of his team? There is nothing inaccurate about the report last week in, in regards to that there's players in the locker room that don't feel Robert Griffin deserves to start. That's nothing new in Washington. That, that's that been reported and that's been talked about for weeks and weeks and weeks. The, the inaccuracy, the problem that I had personally as a reporter that covers the team and that was there, was that on Friday we were in the locker room. There was conversation going on while we're trying to talk to Robert Griffin III. It was the first time we've spoken to him. It was the first time the Redskins made him available for questions and answers. They've been, he just put out a statement, and they really try to keep him out of the media while he's been recovering from the, from the ankle dislocation. So here is our chance to finally talk to the starting quarterback. And the players, it was Halloween, it was Friday, they were acting up, and they were yelling and screaming. And really, it was a media issue. It wasn't an issue with Robert Griffin III. They were also mocking Tony Wiley, the public relations uh, excuse me, the spokesperson for public relations, and you guys may recall Monday night when he... Uh, he no means no. No means no. No means no, exactly. So like, it was funny fodder. Uh, it was wrong for the Redskins to be yelling like that in the locker room. We're, we're there to do a job. 
and, and there's definitely a level, um, an immaturity going on there where, where they need to recognize that. But it is what it is, and it, and it went unreported because it was really something affecting the media. Nobody wants to hear about that. My, I, I know Channel 4 viewers don't care that today was a hard day for me in the locker room because players were yelling. To me, that, that wasn't worthy of a story. My issue with what went out was that it was – a, a group of players that were yelling and screaming because they didn't want Robert Griffin III to start, which is so far from the truth. And it's a farce claim, and, and it was wrong. And that is why you saw uh, local beat reporters like myself, um, Jason Reed, Mike Jones, Liz Clark from the Washington Post, immediately go on social media and, and, and refuse that because that's connecting dots that are not there, and, and, and it's inaccurate. Have you felt covering the team that it's just a daily circus, one thing after another, or is that overblown because of the attention on, I don't know, the franchise, the quarterback, the quarterback situation, a new coach? Is it is it blown out of proportion? I'm a Jets fan, so no. No, I'm <laughs> kidding. Um, no, um, it's it's a lot. This There is definitely some truth to that. Um, every single week, there is something. Every week. Um, and, and, and some of it goes with, with Robert Griffin III and the hype surrounding him and the excitement, the, uh, his personality. He's electric. He's one of these people you want to be around. He has a great heart. He means well. Cameras are always around him. No matter what he talks about, no matter what he's doing, uh, it gravitates towards him. Then you have the players who don't have that attention, and, and some of them care, some of them don't care. The sense I'm getting from the players that I speak with and just the, the, the observation I can make from the outside, looking in at practice and being in the locker room and talking to, to a, a large amount of people in that organization, is that they just want to win now. You know, so much of this goes away on Sunday if they got a victory. And they know that. I, I think that's where a lot of the players felt frustrated more than ever. And I think that's why you saw Jay Gruden up on the podium uh, probably – the most uh, frustrated and angry I've seen him all season because he knows that a win cleans us all up. You know, a win gets this team back on track and nobody is questioning leadership. Nobody's questioning off the field issues. Nobody's questioning yet hooting and hollering in the, in the locker room and, and those reports though, that were inaccurate go away. Diana Rossini, sports anchor, NBC four host of Redskins showtime joining us here on CBS sports radio. There is a clip on the internet, which I absolutely am just thrilled about, since you were a Jets fan, of Rex Ryan throwing you a pass. And as a former athlete yourself, you go out there, you run a fly pattern, and he he hangs some air under it, and you lay out, and you grab it, and he just starts screaming like a five-year-old in a candy store that cannot believe how excited he is. How did that all come about, and did you know... I've got to lay out for this pass because Rex Ryan threw it. All right, so nobody really knows the backstory because no one's ever asked me that. Everyone always asks me, how did I catch it? Or what did he say afterwards? No one ever asked me the before. So here's the, 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 the story. I was out there covering Eric Mangini's camp. He hosts this awesome camp in Hartford, 500, 600 kids uh, get to come and, and, and have a whole day learning the basics and fundamentals of football by NFL coaches, and, and the list is ridiculous of, of the people he's been able to get to come and, and help coach these kids. So I went out there. I was working for NBC Connecticut as the sports anchor there, and I thought I was just covering a charity event, uh, you know, a charity camp and, and, and profiling some, some kids that were getting this opportunity, uh, you know, to, to meet their heroes, so to speak. Um, and it was one of the most dreadful days in terms of weather that I have ever been in my life. It looked really rainy and disgusting. I can't explain to you the rain, the amount of water that was coming down and the fields were muddy. It was horrible. Um, And so I was, I was there, I had my umbrella and, and and I was just trying to get in and get out. To be honest, it was a Saturday morning. It was early as much as I wanted to tell great stories. It was just so miserable. (laughs) I just could care. I wanted to get out of there. And I'm watching Rex and Rob Ryan um, warm up some of the guys. And when I tell you, Rex's arm was like a fourth grader's. I'm like, how is this guy an NFL coach? He can't even throw a spiral. Yeah. This is weird. So I said to my photographer, I'm like, Dad, his arm is terrible. 
And I said it just like that. And he heard me. And at that point, I had not met him. He never, I didn't introduce myself or anything. So he turns around. He goes, excuse me? I said, oh, I just, is your arm hurt? Like, I just didn't know what to say. Yeah. And he said, are you criticizing my throw? I said, yeah. He said, well, why don't you do it? I said, I'll, I'll do it. I have no problem throwing. And he goes, how about this? Why don't you try to catch it? And then you can critique my throw. So Eric Mangini hears this, and he looked over, and it was like, no, I don't want you doing that, because he was afraid I'd get hurt. <laughs> the layout, I guess. So then it created this kind of mob mentality, so to speak, where everyone started gathering around. And and to make a little very long story short, um, Rex just threw it up, thinking that there was no way I was going to grab it. So I knew, because I criticized him, I had to lay out. And that's what I did. And, and that poor 16-year-old boy that I beat, um, I felt so bad. I told him I'd go to prom with him because I felt like he would never get to <laughs> beat he got beat by a chick. Uh, and he said, no, no, thank you so much. You made me cool because I got on TV for it. So yeah. uh, it, it all worked out. That was the best. Lucky. That was the best pass play that the Jets have completed in like the last five years. So good for you. You were on the receiving right. end of it. I've seen Rex numerous times since then at events and just to, you know, at the combine. And to this day, he's like he will never forget me because of that. Well, uh, you're also uh, an athlete by heart. You you uh, actually played soccer at George Mason, and uh, you went from walk on to scholarship. So you were right there. You're an athlete it, down deep in your bones. So. At that point, how much does that help you in a situation like that? Because do you go into kind of laser focus? All right, man, I'm going to catch this pass. Yeah, this is a competition now. Because normally a sports media member is like, oh, we're just kind of joking around and I'm not getting my clothes wet. Yeah, oh my gosh. I know a competitive person, um, if you ask the guys that cover the Redskins, they're like, you approach everything like you're, you're, you're – the Super Bowl, like you have to win. And and that's just what sports has taught me. I mean, this it started when I was young with my brother and we would shoot hoops in, in the backyard and, and you know, I would, I would stay, I'd go back and forth with him until I won. I wouldn't care. I'd miss dinner. My parents used to scream out the window, like, come in the house. But I, I hate losing. And I think that was a moment for me where I put those sort of um, – professional reporter uh, hat away <laughs> there and just was truly myself and and I, di- I didn't want to to be shown up in front of you know 500 uh, boys and in you know 40 men uh, so that was a chance to to say that listen I may cover your sport and 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 I've never been allowed to play it but if I was I, this is how I do it that's so great. And the reaction from Rex is priceless. He's just... Oh, isn't he crazy? His reaction just, was, was actually better than my catch. It was. He was wailing. It was almost like he was weeping or crying because it was so beautiful. Like he had just gone to see... Uh, the you know the 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 uh, some the, the the some beautiful piece of artwork in Italy like he had just seen um, the the Colosseum or something he's like oh my God what a catch I saw Coach Mantini uh, last season when uh, San Francisco played uh, the Redskins he's now a tight ends coach with them and he said that people, whenever people talk about his camp they bring the catch up and he doesn't like to talk about it because he still thinks. That if I got hurt, I could have sued his camp. And it, he always is like, he doesn't even smile at that. I'm like, come on, it was such a cool moment. And he's like, no, no, bad idea. How close was your old Ford Explorer to dying when you used to drive it to Wizards games to be their in stadium host? One of the most embarrassing days of my life, I was sitting uh, at a traffic light in that old Ford Explorer, and I, well, my schedule was crazy. I take class in the morning, run to practice. My coach used to let me leave 15 minutes early because he knew how badly I wanted to be a sports journalist. This is when you were playing soccer at George Mason. Yeah, this is at George Mason. So he allowed me to leave practice early because I had this opportunity with the Washington Wizards um, to be their in, uh, in-house arena host, which is uh, was my first real opportunity to be in front of a camera. So I took it, even though I had no sort of cheerleading background I was going to try to make it um make it my own in a way less cheering and more informational in the, in in the stadium and on the court talking about the players and where the Wizards were at so coach would let me leave early and and I had this this awful, awful 
Ford Explorer, and I'll never forget sitting in a traffic light. And it was it was kind of a warm day, and I hear a bunch of girls screaming. Um, I my window down, and I'm like, "What? What is that noise?" And I'm looking around, and I don't know what it is. And then I look in my mirror, and I see all this blue exhaust, all this blue smoke. Oh. Far behind me are a bunch of teenage girls in a convertible, and it was <laughs> it was blowing into their car because and with their top down. Oh, that's fantastic! The coughing and the smell, and I pushed the gas pedal so hard to the <laughs> Because I was so embarrassed, and I sold that car for two hundred dollars when I graduated. <laughs> Who so would buy crazy. that for two hundred bucks? Where they need parts? My father says that all the time. He's like, "Why would anyone buy that?" Whereas I wanted to say, "Why would you let your daughter drive around in that? Why wouldn't you ever offer to throw me like a loan or a few bucks to help me get a better car so I was driving around Washington D.C.?" But he, my parents had this attitude. You, you you buy what you could what you earn and, and if if you're earning you know a thousand dollars a month being an in-house or being a host then that's the kind of car you're gonna drive a, a crappy car that's gonna pollute the air and ruin the earth <laughs> <laughs> uh, without trying to to help out stalkers here I noticed in your bio that you live in Chevy Chase Maryland I don't know if that's still true anymore but that was on the NBC website so I was wondering I, this is kind of like a chicken or an egg question. Is Chevy Chase the actor named after the town, or is the town named after the actor? I don't know. I think it's the ta- the actor named after the town. Um, and I, I don't want to put out my address, but my address makes it even funnier. Um, whenever I give people, my family or friends, that they want to send stuff like where I live, they're like, is this a joke? Like, who lives on this street in this town? I'm like, I know. It's odd. Well, what, what is it? Like, 1500 National Lampoon's Lane or something? Like, yeah, that's... right? No, there's definitely there's a weird connection name that goes with it, and it's it's so foolish. But it's actually a beautiful area to live. It's a, I, I live on the line, like the Maryland-Washington, D.C. line. I'm, I'm close to, to NBC Studios, which is why... Uh, I chose to live there, but I was unaware when I moved here and I took the job in Washington that the Redskins practiced an hour away from my apartment. Ah, that's tough. So that's every tough. day, and, and I know, I'm sure you know that the traffic in D.C. is notorious. Um, so, yeah, it's two hours every day of just probably three hours of just getting there and back. But, yeah, Chevy Chase, great name, to great, great place to live. I was going to say, I mean, you're a New York City gal, and so you know the New York City traffic. As bad as New York City is, and I lived in Boston, Boston can be really bad as well. I don't think anything, and L.A. obviously is a disaster. I don't know if anything compares to D.C. For whatever reason, I guess D.C.'s infrastructure is just so bad, or the roadway is so bad, and there's so many people going so many places. That's got to be the worst place in America for traffic. I lived in New York. I lived in L.A. So I have really good touchstone, so to speak, places to reference, and nothing comes close to Washington, yeah. D.C. traffic. <laughs> nothing. And, and it, this is why Sports Talk Radio is so popular right. and why, why I actually love doing it and I love being a part of it because it's part of people's days because they're in the car so much. Um, I, I have friends who invest more in a luxury car and live in, in sort of a low-income sort of one-bedroom apartment because they spend more time in their car than they do where they live sometimes. Luckily, you didn't have to live in your Ford Explorer. Please, the car I have now is is, is about even. <laughs> that or in fact, a lot of people are like, when do you get to upgrade? Like, you're a sports anchor in a big city. I just, I don't know. I got to get my act together here because it's definitely time to get a new car. Well, I guess we can't call you a diva then, so that's good. Oh, no, I'm a diva. Oh, please. My camera guy would tell you, I, I asked him to carry my bag all the time. My arm hurts. <laughs> I hate wearing heels. I'm such a diva when it comes to that stuff. But, but when it, material things, I can care less. I probably need to uh, invest in, in better things. But I, I don't know. I, gr- I grew up with, with pretty much average stuff. So I, I don't even know what luxury is. Well, you can follow Diana on Twitter and on Instagram. Very easy. NBC Diana is where you can find her. NBC D I A N N A at uh, at both Instagram and on Twitter. Also, Diana Rossini. You can watch her if you're in DC. All of our 106.7 The Fan listeners, and then everybody else in uh, in that area. Part of Redskins Final, as well as the host of Redskins Showtime. And there's never a dull moment, so there's always a reason to follow Diana or to be watching her on TV. 
We know this. It's not going to end anytime soon. And so we know you got a bye week, but uh, back to the chaos, I'm sure, a week from now. And maybe there's even going to be chaos this bye week. Who knows? Yeah, no, I uh, I pretend that I shut my phone down and, and, and I decompress, but I really don't. Uh, I promised my family and friends that this week cause I'm trying to catch up with everybody because no one knows who I am. And, you know, my parents still don't even believe I'm on TV. They think <laughs> I'm all the time. I mean, they constantly uh, make references like, yeah, sure, you're working that much. But I'm trying to trying to balance my life a little this week. But um, knowing this Washington Redskins team is my second season covering them, I'm sure something will happen this week. But I, I think I think fans are, are, are tired, too, as much as we can all complain and say it's been it's been a long season. It just this team needs a win desperately, and, and hopefully this bye week will be good for the team and, and the coaches to to recharge their batteries and and reboot and and come back and see if maybe the second half of the season here uh, they can figure out who they want to be and find their their find their identity uh, and not feel that this season was a waste. Uh, you know, because I I've heard that I hear, I hear some people especially on Twitter say season's a joke. You know, what, what, what's getting accomplished? What is this team learning? Because the same mistakes are being made. So I'm really looking forward to see how Jay Gruden can, can be the leader and bring this team together and, and find a way to develop RG3. If nothing else, relax, unwind, and de-stress by watching the Jets and the Steelers. I'm sure that's going to be a fun game for a Jets fan as well. You know, I just, I'm cursed. I just this big black cloud over my head. Uh, I can't stand the fact that I'm a Jets fan. I want to, I want to change, but any every, any sports fan knows you can't do it. You, you <laughs> say you're going to every Sunday. I'm done. I'm done. I'm never watching them again. I hate them. I hate you, Rex Ryan. I hate you, Geno Smith. I hate you, Michael Vick. I hate you, <laughs> Kristen. Everyone. I hate you all. I hate every quarterback. But I, I don't. I love that. I, I, I sort of watch the Jets the way you watch a scary movie. It's like you kind of look between the fingers of your hands like, come on, come on, just do it. Yeah. So I, I'm hoping they, uh, they they can figure it out, too. You know, Rex Ryan can pull things out. So you never know with him. He, he'll fight to the end. I know that. No question about it. Diana, this was a lot of fun. Thanks so much for joining us. No, thank you so much for having me on. Well, thanks so much to Diana Rossini for joining us here on the show from NBC4 in Washington. Remind you, we remind you here on the Permission Granted podcast to subscribe to us using both the YouTube.com slash the DA show. All of these are on YouTube. Also, the weekly podcast available on iTunes as well, so you can subscribe there to get it on your phone or whatnot, or on SoundCloud. So we are in many, many places. All right, so joining me now is uh, is Mraz. And, Mraz, let's start out with the disaster. That is the Washington Redskins. Don't you think it's weird, no matter what's true or not about this past weekend stories surrounding, you know, the guys yelling while while RG3 is trying to get interviewed, don't you think it's weird that we're now into season three and there's still a question about whether or not the team likes him at all? You know what? It's odd. Everybody would assume that, no, I actually don't think it's weird. When you think of how how hard it must be for an entire team to get behind a guy who's never in the huddle and never on the field with them. RG3 is constantly hurt, and there's all those rumors, too, that circled at the end of last year that he was too close to Daniel Snyder, and that's what separated the Shanahan thing. That can't rub guys on the team the right way. Yeah, but isn't that... See, that's the reason why I believe there's got to be some smoke here, or there's got to be some fire around the smoke. We've heard that he's too close to the owner. We've heard that maybe the guys don't respect him. He is always injured, uh, He yet he has all of these endorsements. You see him on the Subway commercial all the same, all of the time. All of this, nothing, nothing affects quarterbacks this much right. with this, when you don't play. And so I think this is this is why I think there's got to be some credibility or at least uh, some validity here to this story. Because how many guys in year three who were supposed to be the franchise guy already get kind of this much? This much smoke and this much nonsense around. Him. It doesn't happen. And he's in year three, and at least in year one, he did take them to the playoffs. So it's not been right. a total, total disaster. Right. It. I think there's totally fire there. I, just, I like that little saying too. When there's smoke, there's fire. That's a good saying. You like in that sports. saying? I love that saying. Okay. Interesting. Makes, makes me feel like I'm roasting weenies. Is, is it because it does make you feel like s'mores and weenies are roasting? Or is <laughs> of this course. Just... just one of those, well, I don't know, there's a lot of those crutch phrases I'm terrible with. I love the where there's smoke, there's okay. fire. All right. Well, I think that it's legit here and, and talking to. Uh, Diana, I think that uh, she she kind of suggested that uh, maybe the one on Friday wasn't as bad as it sounded, but did admit that there's always something going on in Washington. Right. 
and that's got to go back to the owner because Absolutely. this has happened before this coach and before this quarterback. Well, just look at everything that happens in Dallas, too. When you have an owner like that that's constantly in the forefront, and there's always going to be a trickle-down effect. They, the Jets, too. Woody Johnson's the same thing. It always starts up top. It's always these types of owners where there's always some kind of circus act going on. It's no coincidence. So, speaking of the Jets, her story about Rex Ryan and his nood- <laughs> his noodle arm lofting one up and her having to go dive and stretch out uh, is pretty amazing because we haven't seen a Jets wide receiver really show that type of effort in years. She is already, through that story, she probably showed more to Rex than Stephen Hill did <laughs> in the years he has been since he's drafted out of Georgia Tech. I love that she was chirping on, on Rex, too. you got to love that, too. And you know what? you got to think Rex respected yeah, that in a yeah, way, yeah. too, because Rex comes across that way. If you're going to call Rex out, he's going to show you love, especially probably, you know, Good-looking girl like her on the sideline. Rex was all about it, chucking it down. How weird, though, is the dynamic when you think about it with really reserved Eric Mangini, who's probably (laughs) just no fun whatsoever, and then Rex, who's probably the life of the party. That must be the weirdest grouping ever. Right, exactly. At a camp like that where it's all buttoned down, probably Mangini wants to run it. You know, you can picture Rex just coming through with a 12-rack and natty lights (laughs) just crushing them in the parking lot, ready to roll and have a good time. (laughs) You know, it's still sometimes I have to think back and really – remember that Eric Mangini was the head coach of a Jets team that went to the playoffs. He had an appearance on the Sopranos. <laughs> I mean, on the Sopranos. Remember, he was... The man he, genius. He was the celebrity in New York. He was the celebrity man genius next Belichick. Which is pretty amazing. Just shows you what 10 wins for a Jet franchise can do. What is he doing now? I don't even know if he's an analyst anymore. I haven't seen him in a long time. He has a fat face, so I always look for that fat face on TV. I have not seen that in a long time. Is that what you usually use, a fat face? Well, to- a fat face, if you notice, with all the pixels on your HD TVs, it usually sticks out really big. Mangini's one of those fat face guys, and when you don't see him in a while, you wonder if he's all right. Now, so you're allowed to say fat face? Yes, I'm allowed. Well, fat face goes, it's not fat, fat. Okay. Fat face is like a word. So I can say fat face, too. Right. It's, it's like on the air when you call the guy pissy pants. No. <laughs> it's Fat face is a, is a phrase. We can say this now off the air because we're off the air. There is something. Uh, we're not really supposed to use the word piss on the air, right? No, we are not. Now, ticked. We're you supposed to say ticked off. Now, pissed off is not terrible, but you're not allowed to say that guy took a piss. No, 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 no. That's no, not okay. No, no. Now, they they even frown on CBS says, well, we really don't want you to say he's pissed off either. Exactly. They want to they refrain from anything that could be misinterpreted in that direction. You Now, you've sometimes you'll hear me say the guy's hacked off. I will use hacked off because I think hack, ticked off seems like what you're trying to say when you're not supposed to say pissed off. It's very PG. Yeah. It so, almost seems like you're seeing a really bad Jason Alexander movie, like that monkey Dustin checks in. Or, or it's, it's when... Uh, you're watching the 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 movie on cable television or on network, and it's dubbed over. Oh, isn't so, that the worst? By the way, how do those work? Do they retape separate lines for those? No, those are actually uh, voice actors that are made to sound like the. That's actors. pretty incredible. So yeah. they're like little caliendos all across yeah. in these studios yeah. doing that. They will sometimes use lines from earlier in the movie or later in the movie. Oh, to redub it and to like re-voice it, voice it. But mostly, it's voice actors that are. So that's why they sound so terrible. I always wondered that. I'm yeah. glad we got to bring that to yeah. the attention yeah, here yeah. on the podcast. So CBS, to go back to the point, is not they they, they don't like the piss. So, uh, so <laughs> that's a good way of putting it. So the other night I called uh, Jacob in um, Lansing, right? Uh, pissy pants because he was he was just being such a pissy pants about the SEC. He was a Big Ten uh, defender, but I I think pissy pants is okay, even if pissed off is not. Uh, I would agree, and as long as you don't take too long of a hesitation between the pissy and the pants, it's got to flow. Pissy pants. Can't say pissy pants. No, no, no. Don't take too long a breath. Pissy pants flows just like fat face flows. So you don't want to say fat face. You want to say fat face. You you are the executive producer here, so you have the ten. You have the ability to dump something off the air if it goes. Right. So you will allow me to say pissy pants, or I, I need to. Am I on some type of um, a quota? Some type I, of pitch, I mean, yeah, am I on a pitch count here? Exactly. You don't want to rattle off six of those in one, you know, minute. But we'll do that. And I know Kenny's always quick on the trigger there. He's always looking at me for like the double check. He's the catcher looking into the dugout. Like, right. Get rid of this here. <laughs> I gave him the I gave him the green light. You don't have to lay down the bunt. Before I let you go, um, so the Giants played on Monday night and they got housed by the Colts, and we had the picture on Facebook. Facebook dot com slash the da show you got to go there to check out this picture of everything you guys the morass household ate and it's just good eating it not only is it good eating it's uh it's a disaster scene i mean it it looks like a slasher movie it's it was a little rough it was a little rough now after we talked about on the air did you catch any flack from your family um Uh, 
Well, my my sister was very upset because I made a reference to her drinking the Diet Coke and acted like she was slimming. She was very unhappy. And even referenced that she's thanks that we're not on New York. She listens on the TuneIn app yeah. because she'd stay single. But I did check in. I have a tendency when I go to the gym at home, since I only live six houses away, it's been yeah. well documented. Uh-huh. I'll leave my dog at my parents' house just so he's not home alone. And my mom lit into me about this. Oh, boy. She was not happy. Oh, she no. said uh, more or less just the fact that the house looks so cluttered <laughs> on top of the food. And I think somebody made reference to uh, basically the show looking like it should be on the show Hoarders. <laughs> and she she had read every comment. So I think that really annoyed her more than anything Uh-oh. was that the, the house just looked a mess on top of the food because she had co- coats thrown ever. She's in the process of now cleaning up all the Halloween decorations so that random pumpkin was right there and everything. And she didn't feel like the food was okay, but everything <laughs> wasn't displayed properly. I don't know how your mom could read every one of our comments because, I mean, our followers on Facebook and on Twitter are vicious folk. They are. They are. You know, she's got some thick skin too, but man, all it takes is one or two comments. And it's ironic. She cared more about the house being hoarders. Nothing about, you know, the comments about me basically dropping dead of a heart attack. She was cool with with, I was going to say, man, it, you know, if, if our listeners are savage about anything, they are savage about your weight right. and uh, your health and everything. That was not what she has taken offense to. Unless it, she's just grown immune to it now. <laughs> you got to check out the picture. It's so good. Facebook.com slash the DA show. I also tweeted it out, but you get to see the thread of all the comments under the Facebook uh, Facebook picture that we put up there. All right. Uh, when you go there, like the show page. That way we'll get your timeline popping. Right now, Mariz and Kenny Brock take off uh, on the next portion of the Permission Granted podcast. Welcome in the Episode 12 of the Permission Granted Podcast, Side B, with myself, Kenny Brock from the Wheels of Steel, and executive producer of the DA show, Sean Morash, otherwise known as at Sean Morash CBS. Shawnee, what's happening? Kenny Branch, how's it going? Oh, don't start with that stuff, man. We're, we're, we're inching ever closer to the debut of Kenny Branch, apparently, but um, you know maybe we'll dive into that a little bit later. I uh, just want to remind everybody to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. Check us out on YouTube, youtube.com slash the DA show. Also, we are available on SoundCloud. That is where we initially upload the podcast. So you can go there and listen to it very simply. And if you don't have any of those mediums, check us out on Twitter at KBrockJR. Uh, the aforementioned Morash's Twitter is at Sean Morash CBS. Uh, we will all tweet it out once it's uploaded a couple times over the next week and change. And uh, that way you can check it out there. So let's start out with uh, a hot button topic that was, you know, basically took over the show in the beginning of the year or I, 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 in the beginning of the summer. And then it kind of died down um, and now has kind of risen back to power. LeBron going back to Cleveland, but we're not going to talk about on the court. Last week, before LeBron's home opener, his his season opener, back in Cleveland, back in his hometown of Cleveland, technically from Akron, Gatorade released a commercial of LeBron, and it was kind of uh, the same thing as the Jeter when he was, you know, his farewell tour in New York. It wasn't the same thing, but it's the same same premise. Don't correct me, okay? It is what it is. If you need to be corrected, I'm going to correct you. So they played that, I believe it was, you know, like the intro to the game and everything like that. They played it during the TNT broadcast, which we'll get to in a little bit. But comparing the Jeter to the LeBron commercial, Mraz and I obviously on opposite ends here. Mraz, what do you think was the more heartfelt, more meaningful commercial? It obviously was Derek Jeter. (laughs) And I don't know. Why obviously? Well, because if you just watch both of the commercials... Number one, the song, the, you know, I did it my way, totally sells the Jeter commercial. He He's walking through through River Avenue there. He's saying goodbye. It's what's, all a, a, what's a River Avenue? Uh, it's the avenue running behind Yankee Stadium, the strip of stores and bars. He goes into stands. It's all about saying farewell and saying goodbye, where I think that's a little more heartfelt than, no way. hey, I'm here again. No, that's and that's not what the, the LeBron commercial was. The LeBron commercial was a triumphant return for the city's prodigal son who had left to go win because he needed to grow up. Sometimes, you know, you in in relationships, you have to be away from one another for a little while, whether it be a mother or father, whether it be a girlfriend, whether it be a boyfriend or a brother-sister relationship. Sometimes you need time apart so that you can both grow and then you come back and you respect and you you know, yearn for the other one. Is that how we're selling this now? I'm just telling you what it is. That LeBron commercial, legitimately, I had chills there at the end, you know, with the 
with everybody putting their hand up in the air, you know, bring when he's breaking it down, basically with the entire city, because you know what? This entire city rallies around LeBron James. LeBron James is their one and only hope for bringing a championship to a city starved for a championship since I believe it was like 1956 was the last time the Indians won the World Series. <clears throat> I mean, I, I don't know how you can argue it any other way. I think the, the Jeter commercial was really nice. I thought it was great. It was a really good send-off. But in terms of someone meaning more to where that commercial was based out, like New York has so many different things going on. Like, yeah, Jeter won a couple World Series with them. Whatever, but Le- but he's not from here. He's from like California or Maryland or something. He was born in Jersey. He's from Kalamazoo, Michigan. Yeah. Okay. So he's not from. He, he's it's comp- two opposite. You know, it's apples to oranges. Who, by the way, didn't need to mature and leave the Yankees to come back. Yeah, and be because where he, he walked to be. into a team that was loaded. The, you're going to tell me that the Yankees wouldn't have won those World Series without Jeter? He was a big part. You're of an idiot. A lot Shut of the big the hits. Up. How can Give you me say, Scott Brocious any day of the week? Please. And Scott Brocious played third base. So here's the problem with the LeBron. Now, I know commercial. where he played. Number one, the whole, it was almost like they did too many people. You know, how many actors does it take to screw in a light bulb there with the together? Win together. And, and they, oh, because, because he means that much to a freaking city? And they, the entire freaking city, while half of half goddamn New York couldn't give two S's about. Because it's a bigger Derek city, Jeter? so now we're going to punish no. the Jeter commercial because No, but there's just people just city. don't give a damn about what the hell Derek Jeter f- you don't, to the you Yankees. You don't give a damn because you're a Yankee no, hater. No, I'm not a Yankee hater. You're a Yankee freaking apologist just like you are a Giants apologist and a Rangers apologist because you can't separate yourself from your you know, who, your who fandom because you're not a grown adult. Like, I am you're like separate this, myself. No, I like LeBron. No, you're a little kid when it comes to this kind of stuff. LeBron is the bigger storyline. This commercial was better in for every reason that I just mentioned. He is the only it thing, the only, the only glimmer of hope in Cleveland right now. The, the Browns are nice right now. You know, they're above 500. They're kind of in the mix there in the AFC North. Very cool. The Indians, you know, they kind of mired in mediocrity. They, you know, made the playoffs, what was that, two years ago? Very cool. They re-signed Terry Francona through 2018. Great. Well, baseball knowledge you're digging up there How about here, that? Huh? How about that? Kenny's usually uh, usually checked out on the baseball. Yeah, I know. I don't know why that all of a sudden just came to me. The Yankees have won 27 World Series. Right. Five of them with Eric Jeter. How many did Jeter win? You lose count when you're a Yankee fan. They won the four. I think it's five, yeah. Okay, so he won five. So, okay, without him, they have 22. Uh, not even without him. Uh, they would have won at least probably four of those five without Jeter. Ah, how could you say that? It's because pretty I can't, unfair. No, it's, uh, it's not pretty unfair. It's pretty true. They would have won those without Derek Jeter. The only one maybe you know, was that play uh, against the A's where he came across, you know, cut in front 2000, of 2000, the... they're not winning without Derek Jeter. I don't remember. I was 2000. That was uh, 14 years ago. I 2000, was he was the All-Star MVP and the World ago. Series MVP. No. So LeBron means more to Cleveland than Derek Jeter will ever mean to New York, and you can take that to the bank without question. And that makes that commercial hit home, you know, for people even harder because people maybe, you know what it is? Maybe this is just dawning on me because a city that, you know, doesn't have, you know, isn't used to winning all the time. We relate more with somebody like LeBron and some and, and a city like Cleveland, whereas arrogant New York fans who win, a, you know, a championship every five or so years take them for granted, and just expect them at some point. Whereas I have only seen one championship in my entire lifetime. It was 2008 uh, Phillies. And then it was the 2004 Super Bowl with the Eagles where they lost to Tom Brady. But you've seen one uh, two years, or how many years ago? was it? 2011 with the Giants. 2009 with the Yankees. 2009 with the Yankees. And last year the Rangers went to the Stanley Cup. And then, uh, what was it, 2008 with the Giants? January 2008. It was the 2007 season. 2007 season with the Giants. And then, you know, throughout the 90s, you were littered with with the Yankees World Series. So I don't think maybe that you appreciate what a, an athlete like that can mean to a, sti- to a city who's been starved for so long and who is in dire need and will do anything to, to, to get to a championship and to win a championship. Maybe that's where we differ here. I think there's a lot of truth to what you're saying, and that's fair. I mean, I'm used to winning, and and you're not, so you can hang in there with all that stuff. I just thought the overall quality of the commercial just it got very monotonous, where the Jeter commercial just flowed more to me personally. Okay. All right. Well, speaking of championships and everything that gets put into them, and what it means to certain you know parts of the country and certain cities, etc. This is nut cutting weekends in college football. There's no doubt about it. Uh, the second set of college football rankings were released by the college football playoff committee. Uh, not too much, uh, you know, 
griping here. You know, it is what it is. You, you can't get overworked on these situations because it's going to be a fluent situation week in and week out. But this, no question, no doubt about it, this is going to separate the men from the boys. The cream's going to rise to the top. We have six top 25 matchups heading into this weekend. Uh, Mraz, any arguments or anything with uh, how the top 25 was laid out by, by the college football playoff committee? No, not at all, actually. Okay. I had absolutely zero problems, especially with the top four. Okay. Well, I did. I, I don't believe that Oregon deserves to be in there, but we can dive into that um, in a little while. Let well, me just... well, before we dive into yeah. it, why? Because everyone's giving Oregon credit for going on the road and beating a garbage UCLA team, and there's no two ways about it. UCLA is trash. They don't deserve the respect that they're getting by the playoff committee. I don't understand, you know, why they are so why the committee is so um, hell bent on giving them credit there. But you know, at the same time, you know, if you look into say, you know, the Big Ten or something like that. Uh, Indiana goes and beats Missouri, who is now the, the f- number one seed in the SEC right. East. But that gets thrown under the rug. There's too much of a disparity between what matters, what games matter, what games don't matter. And by the way, that Indiana win at Missouri was on the road. So it was a road game, a road win against an SEC opponent. So I think there's just too much of a disparity between what what's going to matter for certain teams. There's certain criteria that matters for certain teams and certain conferences. And then there's other things that don't get factored in because there's a, a, a fundamental lack of respect for certain conferences, oh. which is which is fine because the Big Ten... It's going into the Big Ten. Yeah, State, but Oregon exactly beat Michigan State. Right, which is fine. I'm saying that. So And they're four spots back. But what I'm saying is that I just don't understand the love fest with Oregon. And by the way, Oregon lost to... Arizona, am I am I wrong there? Yeah, no, they did. And Arizona has turned out to be a dud because they lost to UCLA last weekend, right? Right. So I, there's just I don't understand what the well, if it's, if, it's, not, it's if not Oregon, other than Alabama, who? Uh, I don't like Alabama at five. I think TCU should be in in the okay. four spot. I think TCU has the most quality wins. <clears throat> excuse me. And I think that they they have the possibility for the most quality wins uh, when the schedule ends in a couple weeks. But well, maybe it shakes out that way. Well, no, it will. See, that's the thing. Like, I'm the type of person who gets all hot and bothered by these things as they come out, and then once I sit back and think about it, I'm like, you know what? It's all going to shake itself out, and it's going to shake itself out in a big way this weekend. We have six matchups of top 25 teams going against each other. Number 12, Baylor, at number 15, Oklahoma. That one doesn't really kind of matter. Uh, I know we had Bryce Petty, Bryce Petty on earlier in the week, and he was talking about how every weekend is a championship. Because they don't have the championship. Because the Big 12 does not have a championship. So Baylor kind of is still hanging around there, could maybe make some noise, but um, you know, I just put them in there because it's a top 25 matchup. Then you have a very interesting matchup, Notre Dame at Arizona State. You have Kansas State at TCU. Alabama at LSU, Ohio State at Michigan, and then in the nightcap you have Oregon at Utah. Um, what, as I read them off, what game jumps out to you the most that has the most implications going forward in the college football playoff rankings? Well, I mean, they all have implications. To me, I think there's two games that I circle. Number one, Arizona State, if they could take care of Notre Dame at home, that's a huge win. And Arizona State already jumped them in the polls. Exactly. exactly. They're and ahead. they got smoked by UCLA, don't forget. Exactly. Well, they're ahead of them, too. But that's a team, Arizona State, that I think, you know, make a nice charge in the Pac-12, keep your eye on. That could be a sneaky, sneaky yeah, team. Yeah, out of the Pac-12 South, I think that that could definitely be the team that would face, you know, most likely Oregon in the Pac-12 championship. Also, I mean, you expect Alabama to win this game, but that's not easy going into LSU. At all, and that could be a game where Alabama gets caught here and then the dream is dead. Yeah, I mean, Alabama already has one loss on the schedule, and don't forget two of their remaining games after this LSU game, Mississippi State and Auburn. I mean, that... If They're they, going 3-0 and in the next three weeks? I, I don't see it. They're not that good either. of a team. And to be completely honest with you, I'll let you in a little something because... You Alabama, got a little something? Alabama's going to lose to LSU on Saturday. Is that right? That's right. Alabama's going down. Well, knowing your track record, I guess put all your money on Bama. <laughs> no, I can pick the top games. It's when I try to dive into everything else that it becomes a problem. Yeah, suddenly you knew what Temple was all about, huh? Oh, my God. I mean, talk about a team. You know, they hadn't won a, a home game versus ranked opponent since, you know, 1936. To before. Be, to be fair here, how many snaps at Temple football did you watch going into that, making that pick? Uh, none. And they, 
I'm, I can't go into it. I can't rehash old injuries. It's as John in soon. Pittsburgh said, yeah, your guess is as good as mine. No comment. So my guess, I guess, would be for the most important games of this weekend. Um, the first two I think you gave were, were interesting, but I think it's two that you didn't mention. I think Kansas State at TCU, be at number six and number seven in the college football playoff polls, I mean, TCU has some some great, great wins. They had that tough loss to Baylor, which is their only blemish on the schedule right now. If they can take down a Kansas State team who whose only loss um, – you know, is to an SEC team. Right. And, and you know, I mean, that's uh, – and at home to an SEC team on a Thursday night, they lost, I think, to Auburn 20-16, to 16, I believe it was. So they were there all night, and they shot themselves in the foot several times. But I think TCU is the fourth-best team in college football right now. They got a little love fest going for the Horn Frogs. I do. I, I like what Gary Patterson does. I was not sold on them going into the season. I like what Boykin does. I think that Patterson runs a really nice defense, and I think that that, that travels anywhere – that this game at home will be really interesting. You know, sneaky old man Bill Snyder still has something to prove. They both, you know, this is basically it for them in terms of what they can prove uh, on their remaining schedule. K-State only has West Virginia. Uh, oh, they have Baylor still left, and they have Kansas. So K-State still have a little, a little work to go. TCU, though, this is a time for them to step up. Uh, they got Kansas, Texas, and Iowa State. So if they can put it to K-State – and Kansas State hangs in against West Virginia and Baylor, that K-State win really, really looks great for them, and they will skyrocket up the polls. The other game, obviously, I'm going to go with the Big Ten. I think this or this Ohio State and Michigan State game is really interesting for, for many reasons. Or, Urban Meyer, in his couple years at Ohio State, has not beaten a top-15 team yet. C- can you believe that? Which is insane to think about. Yeah, it I really mean, is. When you think about Urban Meyer, you think about just you know pumping out big-time wins. He hasn't done it on the big stage. Remember, he lost in the Big Ten Championship. Last year was a major year letdown to in Michigan that game. State. And then he lost in the bowl game to Clemson. This year, they lost at home to Virginia Tech, which is just a, a, a disaster. And so now they get to go. They traveled East Lansing on Saturday night. It's the ABC primetime game at 8 o'clock. Um, I think that this team, this Ohio State team, has grown exponentially since that week two loss um, at home against Virginia Tech. And it this has a ton of implications in terms of we'll see what the committee really thinks about the Big Ten. If if Michigan State waxes Ohio State and they don't move up a, a meter in in the rankings, well, then, you know, Big Ten, you're basically screwed. Pack up the season and enjoy whatever True. bowl game you go to. Uh, if Ohio State can go in and if they squeak by Michigan State, I don't think that they'll crack the top ten. Uh, but if they go in there and they beat Michigan State by double digits, I think you'll see – see them sneak up because you're going to have at least two teams uh, drop out of the top 10 this weekend with Notre Dame and Arizona State facing off against each other and the K-State TCU game. So Michigan State, you know, is going to, if they can beat Ohio State either which way, it doesn't have to be a blowout. It doesn't have to be, um, you know, it could be a, you know, a field goal as time expires to win by one. They're going to move up no matter what, either one spot or they could move up two or three spots. So I, I'm really intrigued by this this weekend slate of college football games, and I think this is where this is you know to coin a a, a, cor- a corny phrase. This is separation Saturday here. Uh, absolutely, you know it's kind of funny too. You almost wonder if that Michigan State Oregon game early in the seasons played at Michigan State. Make, could make all the difference to the world. Michigan oh, State absolutely. wins. How much different do these rankings look right now? So different. Absolutely, that's a great point. I mean. And those, you know, unfortunately, those are ifs and ands and if we coulds that we, you if, know. If ifs can't... and nuts were candies and nuts? Butts? It's either butts or nuts. I don't think it's butts. That uh, would be too PG-13. I don't know. Well, the bottom line is every day would be Christmas. Yeah. I, mm, if I, ifs and nuts, no. Try it. Let's, let's, if let's... ifs and butts were candies and nuts, every day would be Christmas. I think I got it there. That that kind of sounds right, but I don't know enough about it to uh, argue on the opposite. Candies and butts. <laughs> what are we doing? I don't know. That got derailed really quickly. Cowboys are flying over to London. They flew over to London already. Cowboys are in a little bit of a free fall, as a certain someone on this podcast predicted. Hashtag Cowboys suck. Hashtag Cowboys suck. 
Tony Romo did not play last weekend with his now two broken bones in his back that apparently Which happened on Monday night. Yeah, no. Which, by the way, I think I have one here. I'm dying. No, you have kidney stones because you drink way too much iced tea. That stuff is terrible for you. It crystallizes in your kidneys. Who doesn't love a good Enjoy iced tea, Enjoy passing though. that through uh, your uh, urethra, bro. I won't make it. It's not going to be... <laughs> You're going to be screaming. You thought you were screaming after the uh, I'll ghost I'll be like Kramer peppers. at the circus. I don't remember that episode. You don't remember oh, that Oh, the clowns. The clowns, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, yeah. the, the tra- trapeze artist. Yeah, oh, right, right, right. <laughs> the trapezist. Yes, yes, yes. All right, so back to the Cowboys. Cowboys, tough uh, stretch of games coming up after this week. They, they're they in London. They play the Jaguars. I, even the if Jaguars? We, Jaguars. Jaguars. No, not Jaguars. 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 It's not wires. Wires. That would be what a trapeze a jag- artist walks on. It's not a Jaguars. Jaguars. No, it's not a Jaguars. You're pronouncing it's a hires. G- it's a Jaguar. You got a weird accent, man. <sighs> anyway, so they're in, <laughs> they're going to be playing in Wembley Stadium. <clears throat> they flew Tony Romo first class. That was a big debate. You know, basically, uh, Jerry Jones said he was going to throw Can his I wife say in storage. Something here? Of course. You can build a, you know, whatever, a $500 billion, however much that stadium cost. Can we just get a nice cowboy luxury plane? Yeah, I don't understand. I, he, I don't get that, that you're basically packing up United Airlines there and you got six first class seats. All right, Jerry and his wife gets one. Witten and Jerry get one. Witten we'll and put, Tony get one. Oh, yeah, yeah I'm sorry. Yeah. Witten, Witten and Tony. You got, you know, Garrett sitting there. Okay, we'll put Scott Linehan over here. And then, uh, you Linehan know, ain't getting a first class seat. Well, Come on. <laughs> everybody else is, ba- you know, back of the bus there. I don't understand that. Yeah. You, you have all this money. You're Jerry Jones. Can we get a nice, luxurious Cowboys plane that can make every one of the flights? Matter of fact, every NFL team should have one. I, I don't understand teams, this. I thought, see, I thought most teams did. I don't. I know this. Um, a weird way. I I don't live far from an airport where when teams fly in to play the New York Islanders, right? They fly in, and I know the uh, ma- MacArthur. Uh, it's not even MacArthur. It's just Republic. It's a small uh, airport. Um, not even for commuter flights, but they fly the team flights in there. And I know every time the Maple Leafs are in town, they have the Maple Leafs have their own plane there with like this big right. Maple Leaf on and stuff like that. I don't understand that. When I read that story, that really jumped out at me. Like, well, basically, what we're, we're picking straws for who sits first class? Right. You're a professional team. And by the way, Demarco uh, sh- better be up there. You basically, what you got the rookie sitting in the middle between two slob offensive linemen there in the back? It well, doesn't make any sense. Yeah, I mean, can I get some leg room? You you would think that Jerry could you know shell out for a Boeing seven forty seven that you know just take out all right. the back coach seats. By the seats way, and... if I'm making all this money playing for the Dallas Cowboys and I got to sit coach, you know what? I'm a little pissed. I'm booking the next flight in. I'll book myself a first class seat on another plane with a bunch of people. Yeah, and I'm sending the expense report to the, what, Jerry's front desk. There's no question. So, with <laughs> talking about the first class seating, you know, with Romo, there was a whole thing with Jerry Jones and his wife, and if whatever. Would you have flown Tony Romo to London knowing how bad his back is and knowing so from New York I flew out to New York from uh to from New York to England in 2010 and it was like a eight and a half hour flight would you have flown to, so that you figure add an hour add two hours would you have flown Tony Romo from Texas to London on a 10 hour flight with his back to play the Jaguars boy I understand why they did it but my inclination would be no, no. I don't think you can. No, that's that's a long flight. A lot can go wrong there, stiffening up. By the way, you have the bye week coming up after this, and you're yeah. and you're playing the Jaguars. If you can't beat the Jaguars with Brandon Whedon, yeah, and I, I exactly, and I think we're in agreement on this. Whedon stinks. Whedon's a bum. We know the whole gimmick yeah, there, right? Okay, but you still got Demarco Murray. You still got Des Bryant. You still have a defense that's playing above its head at times. Yeah. You're playing the Jaguars, man. If that team isn't good enough to win a game with Brandon Whedon versus yeah. the Jacksonville Jaguars. Then they're probably not good enough to make the playoffs anyway. No. To be honest, yeah, no, that's totally fair. And and you know what's it will be even more the the more egregious um, part of this if they flew him all the way there and then don't play him on Sunday. Well, the Lions did the same thing with Calvin Johnson, didn't they? Or did Calvin suit up in that I, game? No, uh, it's, and I'm drawing a blank now. I can't remember if Calvin suited up. But in that I know game, the, right? I know the gimmick though. The NFL wants these superstars there because that's the yeah, whole it's a thing. Draw. It's a meet and greet it. the entire week and all that. But stuff. if you're Jerry Jones, what is the you know? I know he says that they're the the best show on TV, but. Your end goal is to win a championship. You're not winning not a his freaking championship. He's got he's got championships. That ain't his end goal. I, I, I think some part deep down in him still wants to win a championship because he wants to validate doing it without the the big name coaches. If he does it with a Jason Garrett, then you know he'll be able to pump himself up even more. I don't know what the hell is going on there in Big D, but that was a big big disaster. 
and I made my own personal disaster. I took off uh, Sunday going into Monday of, uh, what is that, the 9th into the 10th. Uh, I'm going home back to Philly for the weekend. My cousin plays football for Towson. They're playing at Villanova. So we're all going to that. So I took off, and I figured, hey, you know what? Eagles play uh, Carolina. Play the, Eagles play Carolina. I'll go to that game. And Mirage took off the following weekend, uh, the 16th into the 17th, for the Giants 49ers. Giants 49ers. You're Where else would you rather be? Absolutely. A couple of just dreadful teams. Um, yeah, I foobarred the living bejesus out of mine. Uh, the Eagles play on Monday night, so I can't even go to this. I'm all pumped thinking I'm going to go to do college football all day Saturday, tailgate, pop, pop, pop. Sunday, I'm going to wake up, go down and tailgate all day for the Eagles game, all morning for the Eagles game, and they play on Monday. I mean, all it takes is a quick glance at the schedule. Why assume at all times it's a Sunday? I don't know. I Before they you already... know, we're going to have Wednesday night football, too. Just take a peek at the schedule. I thought they had already played the Monday night game, and I thought it was that was it, and they weren't going to play again. Kenny, I work with you every single night. You're sitting there during the show. You know, you'll put up the chive. You'll, you know, you'll check I out— I don't chive anymore. Uh, I'm off the I've, chive. I've noticed that. You, you know, you'll check out a hot chick. You'll check out something funny in between commercial breaks. Can you just pop up NFL.com and click on the schedule when planning? Yeah, next time. I, I don't understand how that slipped your mind. That was a bad job by me. Um— I don't know what the hell I'm gonna do. I guess I'm gonna, you know, hang out Sunday. And well, then... you're gonna watch the football, but you're just not making the trip to uh, no I'll the probably, link. Uh, I might, I might go down to Xfinity Live and just get loaded and watch the games. I don't got to be back till Monday night. Bring me back a Tony Luke's. Yeah, uh, they don't travel too good, too well. <laughs> I I could go for a Tony Luke's actually. I could too. Now that you bring it up. I could always one, go for a Tony Luke's. One o'clock in the morning. I wonder if I could sprinkle my diet powder on the Tony Luke's cheesecake. Che- Cheese steak. Now I want cheesecake. Uh, I hate cheesecake. There's nothing worse than cheesecake. It's such a weird. Don't tell consistent... me you're a carrot cake guy. I love carrot you know, cake. What is you're a doofus? <laughs> carrot cake. Because I like carrot cake. I'm a I doofus. know immediately when somebody says they don't like cheesecake, they like carrot cake, and you're just a fool. You're just a fool. You're not going to trick How me by you... putting a vegetable into a cake. <laughs> Trust me, you could use a couple of vegetables in your cake. Uh, what the? Uh, what is the correlation though between not liking? Cheesecake and but liking carrot cake. I don't I've know. noticed this a lot in the people I've come across. The anti cheesecakers are pro carrot cakers. It's almost like the Democrats and the Republicans. I don't know anything about that. The latter part of what you just mentioned. In New York, you have Yankee and Met fans. You also have carrot cake fans and cheesecake fans. Rarely do people like both. And on that high note, we will send you off into the weekend. Enjoy the slate of college football, which it won't get any better than this until we get to uh, championship weekend and uh, and the college football playoff. Also, the, you know, what are we in, week 11 here of the NFL or week 10? Uh, who cares? I mean, the season's flying by too quick as it goes. Before we you know it, this. we're basically going to be throwing up the ball for uh, March Madness oh, here. Well, that can't come soon enough either. But, you know, let's soak up these last couple weeks of the NFL, the last two and almost three months of the NFL and enjoy it. And uh, thanks for tuning in. Make, it, make sure to check us out on iTunes. Subscribe to us. Check us out on YouTube, youtube.com slash The VA Show. Check us out on SoundCloud. Uh, Sean and I will both tweet it out at Tabrock JR and at Sean Morash CBS. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you next week.